No other medium can take the place of newspapers in the lives of the people. And the fundamental reason why newspapers are held in such high regard by the American public lies in that long-cherished bulwark of liberty, freedom of the press. The big city newspaper was once ubiquitous in the United States. As American as apple pie, there were often two or more papers per city with circulations that were off the charts. But today, the American newspaper is in its death spiral. The sun has truly set on Johnson County. The Johnson County Sun has ceased publication. The city of New Orleans will soon see daily prints of its only newspaper reduced to just three days a week. The New York Times announced a big layoff. It plans to eliminate 100 newsroom jobs. Every day, in city after city, there are fewer newspapers and fewer journalists than the day before. We now have maybe 35 to 40 percent of the working paid journalists we had in 1990. Now the internet is obviously a big reason for this trend, but we need to be careful here. We first started to see the decline of real resources to journalists in the late 1980s and early 1990s before the internet took hold. During the 80s, media companies had begun to merge into conglomerates and to buy up local newspapers. As monopolies, they successfully eliminated competition but they still needed to maximize profits, so they cut costs by laying off workers. Retrenchment is the byword across the country, even by the giant chains which dominate the newspaper business. The Miami Herald plans to slash 100 non-editorial jobs and has closed two news bureaus. And as we've seen again and again, what was terrible for American journalism and the very idea of the free press was absolutely wonderful for the giant corporations that owned all these newspapers and continued to rake in huge profits. At other papers operated by the giant Knight Ritter chain, there have been cuts. Its chief executive James Batten stresses that it's not that they're losing money. This continues to be a profitable company, doesn't it? Oh, absolutely. We are a very profitable company. For many years, uh, the newspaper business has been uh, substantially more profitable on the average than the typical American enterprise. The concern is mounting in newsrooms around the country that downsizing coverage is not just a byproduct of the recession, but a permanent fact of newspaper life. The point here is that American journalism was already in big trouble before the internet came along. And the reasons had more to do with the commercial basis of our news media system than anything else. All the internet did was make the collapse of journalism permanent and irreversible by putting even more financial pressure on those commercial media companies. From the 1890s on and throughout the 20th century, advertising provided between 50 and 100 percent of the revenue that paid for journalism in the United States. But after the emergence of the internet, this major source of funding for American news media began to evaporate, especially for print journalism. Once people started realizing that a free classified ad on Craigslist was getting more response than a paid ad in the newspaper, ad revenue for paper started to dry up big time. An almost unprecedented drop in revenue for a major American business sector. And the numbers will only continue to get worse with the rise of targeted advertising. When the internet was still relatively new, a firm would pay to advertise on a newspaper's website. The news website would run the ad and the newspaper would get to keep 100% of the revenues, just like they would if the ads ran in their newspaper. But today, this same newspaper is getting less than 10% of the ad revenues. Why? Because 90%, even more, is going to those ad networks that compile personal data on us. All you have to do is drop a little code in your website and immediately it starts working. It would be impossible to make it any easier. You can't beat it. This is where most of the ad money is going now, to these internet monopolies that surveil us and target us with personalized ads rather than to content providers like newspapers or news media themselves. All this has obviously been disastrous for traditional news media. But is it possible it's been good for democracy in the practice of journalism? After all, one of the great promises of the internet from early on was that it was going to democratize journalism by allowing ordinary people to become participants in the system a few years back, none other than Rupert Murdoch, the owner of Fox News, said that power is moving away from the old elite in our industry, the editors, the chief executives, and the proprietors. He proclaimed that we are at the dawn of a golden age of information, an empire of new knowledge. And celebratory claims about the internet democratizing information continue to be made. 
especially since the rise of social media. I have a lot of faith in the wisdom of the American people. They can go and pull the information themselves. It's why so many people in the mainstream media don't like the president using Twitter. Too bad. That's, he's cutting out the middleman. He, it's, it's really, it's the democratization of information. A recent Pew study found that more and more Americans are getting their news online from a handful of internet monopolies. According to the study, almost half of all American adults say Facebook is their primary news source. None of this in itself might seem like cause for alarm until you realize how these internet monopolies are actually delivering news to people. Using the same surveillance tactics that they use to target their users with personalized ads, sites like Facebook have developed algorithms that allow them to filter the kinds of news and information people see when they're on their sites. This means that people on these sites are only getting information in their news feeds that agree with their viewpoints, effectively enclosing them in a kind of ideological filter bubble. If I search for something and you search for something, even right now at the very same time, we may get very different search results you get what I call a filter bubble. And what's in your filter bubble depends on who you are and it depends on what you do. But the thing is that you don't decide what gets in. And more importantly, you don't actually see what gets edited out. So what this suggests is actually that we may have the story about the internet wrong. You know, this is how the founding mythology goes, right? In a broadcast society, there were these gatekeepers, the editors, and they controlled the flows of information. And along came the internet, and it swept them out of the way, and it allowed all of us to connect together, and it was awesome. But that's not actually what's happening right now. What we're seeing is more of a passing of the torch from human gatekeepers to algorithmic ones. And when you factor in the rise of fake news into all of this, things only get worse. And lately there's been a lot of coverage in the real news about the growing and booming business of creating fake news. Facebook is coming under increasing criticism that fake news articles may have influenced the presidential election. We all have what's termed as an internet bubble around us. Different people will see slightly different results when Googling topics based on our browsing history and likes. Cambridge Analytica used that information harvested to push fake stories and conspiracy blogs to people who might be susceptible to taking them as fact. The rise of alt-right news sites during the 2016 election made headlines for promoting the most lunatic, paranoid, and patently false stories. There it is, breaking bombshell. NYPD blows whistle on new Hillary emails, money laundering, sex crimes with children, child exploitation, pay to play, perjury, and of course, you get into it, it involves the occult, because the occult always involves the abuse of children. They're demons. They're freaking interdimensional invaders, okay? I'll just say it, make fun of me all you want on CNN or wherever, but everyone already innately knows this. These people are not freaking humans, okay? Hillary Clinton is a demon damned to hell! Excuse me. <laughs> Thanks to sites like Facebook, these stories were presented on social media sites as real news. A BuzzFeed analysis found that fake election news generated more buzz on Facebook than stories from 19 mainstream news outlets combined. And because internet monopolies are filtering what people are seeing based on personal preferences and not journalistic standards, they're not likely to see a lot of stuff to counter these kinds of bogus views. People are seeing these headlines go by on a Facebook news feed where the real ones and the fake ones in some ways present as the same kind of thing. A lot of the context right. is taken out of it. And I think that is a factor in people believing them. The problem here isn't the internet itself, but the commercial logic that now dominates it. Let's get real. All of these problems exist because of an advertising business model that creates perverse incentives and gives them the incentive essentially to create these bubbles around people where each person has their own set of facts and where they're easily manipulated by bad actors. Making it more important than ever to ask whether a democratic society like ours should be relying on a commercial media system for its journalism to begin with. Every year, the highly respected British magazine The Economist, a leading source for business and political leaders, publishes something called the Democracy Index. What they do is rank all the countries in the world according to how democratic they are. They measure things like how easy it is to participate in the system, voter participation rates, freedom, standard political science stuff. Well, when you look at their rankings of the most democratic nations in the world over the past few years, the United States has been falling down the list pretty sharply. And here's the thing. 
If you look at the countries in the top 10, all of these countries spend a fortune per capita subsidizing public media and journalism and keeping creative dissident voices alive. Now you might say, well, that's an interesting correlation, but it doesn't necessarily mean there's some kind of cause and effect going on between government investment in news media and the level of democracy in a society. It could be just a fluke, a coincidence. So let's take a look at another source, a group called Freedom House. This is an organization that was started to monitor the evils of communism and totalitarianism. And one of the things they do is evaluate all the press systems of the world from top to bottom, best to worst, with a complex rating system. Well, guess what they've found? They've found that the most uncensored, freest, and best press systems in the world belong to the same countries that top the economist list of the most democratic nations. In other words, nations with government-subsidized press rank higher than us. We're known as the leaders of the free world, but we're falling on that list like we've got lead balloons attached to our feet. So despite everything we've been taught, there's no necessary correlation at all between a commercial capitalist media system and a truly democratic media system. And in fact, there's a ton of evidence that says exactly the opposite, that capitalism, left to its own devices, can turn media and communication technologies like the internet against democracy.